All right, Dickie Bush, welcome to Intentional Wisdom. Greg, what's going on, man? Happy Friday. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm fired up to be here. I know you've had a lot of awesome guests, so hoping I can uh, follow up with them. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, I, uh, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. Um, I think of you as one of, if not the most prolific uh, writer on the internet that I know and that I follow. Um, so for our audience members who don't know you, um, well, first of all, I guess that they probably are not on Twitter because it's kind of hard to be on Twitter and not come across Dickie Bush. You've got uh, 300,000 followers or close to, uh, I'm sure by the time this episode comes out, you'll be above that. Um, you're building a large, successful digital writing business. So I want to talk about that. Uh, but you've also got some other really cool stuff in your backgrounds, like um, having played football at Princeton and other stuff. Um, you're one of the clearest thinkers I know. And please take that as a huge compliment because um, it really is. And I, and I want to talk about, you know, how you uh, think essentially. And I think writing's a big part of that. But before we get to all of that, let's start in a really random place. Tell me about your life as a competitive Call of Duty player. So I was a professional Call of Duty player in seventh grade. And it's fun to go back to that time because how I stumbled into, I played baseball growing up mm. until seventh grade and I actually tore my rotator cuff mm. pitching. Um, my, I still remember my last pitch, I felt the full crack rip through my shoulder. And unfortunately at the time, the financial situation that my family and I were in, I didn't have health insurance. And so I, I wasn't wow. getting surgery. My baseball career was pretty much done uh, at that moment. And uh, I actually never had told that wow. story, but I was unable to play sports for about a year and a half, two years, as I kind of just had to heal through that injury. And I ended up channeling, I think, my obsessive personality to video games. I played a lot growing up, and then I kind of transitioned into sports, got that injury, transitioned back into video games, and uh, picked up Call of Duty 4. And I played 12, 15-hour wow. wow. days for, yeah. for a year and a half. Uh, I was probably... I think I was the best player in Florida, wow. debatable, but I was on the pro circuit. I never flew yeah. to any tournaments or anything like that just because I, I was in seventh grade and most people were older. But now, were you, do you, pro circuit, do you actually like make money from this or how does that work? I was technically a professional Call of Duty player because I had won money in a tournament. That's the way I think of okay. it. Okay. So okay. I'd made, they had bigger tournaments that I wasn't quite good enough to get to and those were in like Las Vegas. But tr like this was before twitch streaming i was like two or three years early right. from never playing football in college or doing any of that again but just being a professional <laughs> call of duty player because <laughs> twitch and and all that came like three or four years after yeah. um because it wasn't very popular when i was doing it but we, we might have was never a, a known very fun the time. digital writing dickie bush we might have just known the like all-star video gamer <laughs> like and it's pretty crazy because like esports is all like they, I mean, it's on like ESPN these days and stuff like that. So it's gotten pretty massive. It really has. And I still like kind of keeping up with that world a little bit. I'll check in on what's happening because I mean, those, those teams are now massive media companies and far beyond just gaming. They, they have YouTube channels, they have supplements, they have everything. So it's kind of cool to see how that's taken off. Yeah, that's wild. That's wild. Well, I didn't actually know that about um, that you were a baseball player. That's really interesting. Um, it's funny. I, I played baseball a little bit growing up as a kid, but like baseball. So I have an 11 year old son now and he is super into baseball and um, he plays on travel teams and everything else. But I, and I'm, I'm one of the coaches. So I've been like, you know, every year I'm like, a few YouTube videos ahead of like where I need to be just to like get my knowledge where it needs to be. But it's pretty incredible. Um, you know how much that takes over your life. I'm actually just looking at what, what the first half of 23 looks like for me right now. And we're, I want to talk about 23 plans with you. Cause, cause I think, I feel like you're the master systems planner, but like we were looking at it uh, yesterday. I'm like, wow, I've like baseball commitments like five days a week. Um, and so that's its own forcing function in terms of, uh, you know, how you can most effectively um, use your time. But baseball, I've had, uh, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Teddy Mitrovilis, uh, he's, a, he's a big Twitter guy as well, but he was a baseball player at um, uh, UNC Chapel Hill um, and he was on the podcast as well. So there's actually a lot of baseball folks hovering around this 
uh, segment of Twitter that we that we sort of traffic in. Yeah, baseball for me was actually my first obsession. I was a diehard Tampa Bay Rays fan, and this was when we were losing a hundred games a year. I still remember celebrating when we uh, <laughs> when we won the last game of the year to go sixty three and ninety nine because it meant we didn't lose a hundred games. But I knew every player, every stat. No, all of that. So baseball <laughs> was my first true love sport, and I, I still awesome. keep up with it. That's super cool. Um, I'm a, I'm actually a big Red Sox fan, so um, have a little bit of a rivalry with the with the Rays. But um, uh, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna have uh, Justin Sua um, on the podcast soon. I don't know if you know him, but he's the mental um, performance coach for the Rays. Yeah, um, he's a Rays Rays uh, mindset. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So really cool guy. Um, okay, cool. So, um, uh, you know, the, the call of duty question was kind of, I, 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 I kind of wanted to just establish for folks is something that I think is a real truth about you is that you, um, you really dive in deep into whatever you happen to be tackling at the moment. Um, writing and building businesses is probably the most recent example of that. But I think this has been a real pattern in your life is like really understanding systems, really diving deep into um, the nuances uh, of things, everything from video games to I'm sure you were like that in football to uh, a lot of the, the different endeavors throughout your life. So let's let's fast forward a little bit. I know you... Um, uh, so you went to Princeton, played, played football there, um, got out of there, went to go work for uh, BlackRock. So you were a macro uh, investor at BlackRock. Um, I'm sure you were starting to climb the, the, the ladder there, get more and more responsibility. I know, you know, I'm sure you were doing great at your job and, and, and all that based on everything else, um, you, you know, based on all the other kind of areas of excellence you've achieved in your life. Um, but you decided to leave there early 22. Tell me about how you um, made that decision. That decision was definitely the hardest decision I've ever made in my entire life. Um, it, it makes sense to kind of backtrack a little bit. So I'd only ever worked one job and it was for the same team at BlackRock. I interned going into my junior year of college, my senior year of college. It was the only job interview I'd ever mm -hmm. had. So I didn't, so many of my friends were on kind of the investment mm -hmm. banking track going to networking events, going to interviews constantly. I had one phone call, went up to New York, had an interview, and this was, I was 20, no, 19 years old, going into my junior year um, as a sophomore. So wow. interviewed with them, hmm. was an intern, was working there for four years. It's the only job I know. So the decision to leave was not easy, but it was one that was building up over time. And it started actually when I got there, I'd say, so this was a dream job. I mean, I was a math major. I studied finance and computer science um, and math in college. So no, nothing to do with writing, actually, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit. But I joined that team yep, and yep. thought that that was what I wanted to do forever. Right when I joined, I loved it. I loved the energy. I loved thinking big picture markets, economies, central banks. I mean, I was deep in that world. But slowly, I started to realize that I'm sitting at the most powerful asset manager for a hedge fund within that with some of the smartest people. And seemingly, no one knew any better than anyone else what was going to happen. And I was a little disillusioned at that mm -hmm. because I think growing up or when I started to kind of go down the world of finance, I was like, I was like these guys must know what's going on to capitalize on it. But we were kind of at the whim of Robin Hood traders and things like that a lot of times. And I, as I saw that to kind of unfold, mm -hmm, I was, mm -hmm. I realized it wasn't <laughs> something that I felt like I could master in terms of the long term. If I spent 30, 40, 50 years in this game, would I feel like I had a true mastery of it? And I didn't see that. I also paired that with some more personal mm. anecdotes of, seeing other guys on the floor, very, very particular incident, not, not incident, but I witnessed someone probably in their mid thirties, late thirties, ask their manager if they could get off early on any given day or on this given day to go to their son's little league game. And mm -hmm. I just remember watching that interaction and here mm -hmm. I am 23 years old. Like I'm not even any close mm -hmm. to having kids or anything like that, but I just watched that I remember going home and thinking, 
So if I work here for 12 more years, day in and day out, 7 a.m. at the desk, 7 p.m. Mm-hmm. leaving the desk, pouring mm-hmm. my heart and soul in this, I'm still going to have to ask for permission to go to my son's Little League game. And that haunted me, haunted me. Mm-hmm. And I knew mm-hmm. from that day forward that that was not mm-hmm. going to be something I could do forever. And so that was mid-2019. And immediately I started to think, how can I start to plant some seeds, build a foundation where I'm going to leave this job within the next two to three years? I think it was serving its role. I still enjoyed it, but the writing was on the wall that that was not going to be something I did forever. Fast forward to 2022, I started writing in January 2020, writing a weekly newsletter because I witnessed all the most powerful people at BlackRock were actually the ones who were writing these in-depth, high-quality emails to get their thoughts across. So I was, before I started writing on Twitter, I Mm -hmm. was writing internal emails, updating my team, updating people on the floor, like sending around research reports. I had an internal newsletter with like 500-something readers at the time that I just started because I said, here's what I'm doing all day. How can I use writing as a forcing function to think clearly, to build myself Mm -hmm. at the firm, all that kind of stuff. But then I said, why wouldn't I just do this on the internet where I can reach millions of people? And obviously that took off and we can talk about the whole ship 30 story, but COVID hit March, 2020, we all got sent home. So not only was I um, interested in doing things on the side, but now I was working at my home in Tampa and quickly realized that if I didn't have someone around looking at my, excel like over my shoulder that there wasn't that much work to be done and this goes back to the mastery (laughs) side right it turns out a lot of it was made up and i wasn't i was clicking buttons for the sake of it because so many people were around me and so i built ship 30 on the side all 2021 got to a place where it no longer made financial sense for me to work for someone else when i had something that i could take full ownership of but i mean i still had to wrestle with that decision but i really came down to one lens that allowed me to make that decision and i still remember on the morning where i ended up leaving i it kind of clicked of using this lens of what would what decision would the person i'm trying to become make and to me the person i was trying to become in the long term took risks under their own name they had responsibility and ownership for their financial situation they were building something that they felt fully value aligned with and that clicked on a walk in the morning, went in, made a phone call and left on great terms. I still am in touch with that entire team, but it took me a while to kind of have the clear lens and that lens provided it for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's powerful. Um, That's really interesting to, I I think that is kind of a really interesting um, lens on it to, to look at, you know, someone who is 10, 12 years ahead of you and say, okay, um, can I envision myself in that role? And if not, that's a really great, um, sign that I need to make a pretty drastic change here. So we had, I had a similar situation. So I, w- I was, um, you know, working in finance back in, and I still do, um, but back in the early 2000s, uh, I was with Lehman Brothers, had, had, you know, met my wife and we were looking, we were living in New York City at the time when we were looking at, um, you know, potentially, you know, moving out to Connecticut and doing something like that. And then I was looking at these, these guys that were 10 years ahead of me living, you know, big houses out in Greenwich, the whole nine, but they were like pretty miserable um, because they were, you know, they had to be up at four in the morning on a train at five in the morning, this and that. And I was like, Oh my God, we got to get out of the city. Like, um, so that was, that was a slightly, um, a slightly different version of that. It wasn't a, uh, you know, saying co- goodbye completely to the industry, but it was, uh, you know, I, I think you do need to look ahead and say, is that the track I want to be on? And if, and if it's not, then you got to make a change. Um, otherwise you're going to end up in a place you don't want to be. Um, okay. So talk, so you mentioned ship 30 for 30. So obviously that's been a major focus for you um, over the last couple of years. So tell, if, if our audience um, are not familiar with Ship 30, tell us what it is. And then I'd love to hear about how it has grown um, over, the, let's say, the last two yeah, years. It's, a, it's been more growth in two years on the personal and professional side than I ever could have imagined. So it started 
it makes makes the most sense to tell the story from January 2020, where I started writing and I committed to writing a weekly newsletter every single week for 52 weeks. I said I wanted to expose myself to new opportunities. I know I wasn't going to be working at BlackRock. How could I do that almost passively? And um, I use the Tim Ferriss. What's the worst case? If I do this for 52 weeks, I yep. build a writing habit. I get comfortable mm-hmm. sharing ideas on the internet and I learn quickly, but the upside is basically uncapped because that's how the internet works. So started doing that and followed the conventional playbook of kind of a weekly blog post and a weekly newsletter on my own blog that no one really read. And then I did that for about nine months until September of <laughs> 20, um, 2020. And I realized that this wasn't going to be sustainable because I was waking up on Sundays and hacking away at a blog post that no one was reading except basically my mom. I had about 100 newsletter subscribers after nine months. I had a couple hundred Twitter followers, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I Mm -hmm. said, okay, I don't know if this is for me. I need to figure out something different. So I committed to a personal daily writing challenge for 30 days, which was my way of saying I'm no longer going to fall into this slaving over a hot keyboard, editing, perfectionism, anything like that. I'm going to listen to a podcast every morning. I'm going to take notes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to write that up as a thread and I'm going to post it every day for a month. And I just remember that lens was so powerful for me of putting something out every day, shipping daily. And it's funny, the first 27 days were awesome. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it, but I still remember day 28. I hit publish on something and it got zero likes, zero comments, zero retweets. It was basically like I was back to square one and it didn't exist. And so my version of that was, all right, writing Mm -hmm, on the internet, mm -hmm. I gave it my chance. I gave it my shot. It's no longer for me. But I said, I'm not going to kind of give up on day 29, whatever. I'll just, you know, hit publish on these next two days and that'll be it. And I'll feel good about at least I gave it a shot. And uh, I hit publish on day 29, shut my computer, went to bed and woke up and that thread had gone viral. Still one of my most viral to date. Uh, Naval had picked it up. Balaji had picked it up. And Mm. I went from, I think, 100 newsletter subscribers to five or 600 overnight. So I like to say it took me nine months to get to 100 and 12 hours to get to 500. And my Twitter following tripled. (laughs) I mean, everything accelerated from that single thread. And I really sat back and said, yep. I had a couple yep. big takeaways from that. One, you have no idea what's going to work. So you have to continue to put things out there into the world. And second, I realized mm-hmm. I wanted to keep doing this, but I needed some community accountability to keep me going. So instead of starting another writing challenge, I just tweeted out, hey, I just finished this up, had some good results. Does anyone want to join me in a Slack accountability group? And we do this for another month. And the response was absolutely overwhelming. I, I think I had I had under a thousand Twitter followers at the time mm. when I asked it, but I had like three or four hundred replies on that tweet. And so I uh, man, this is it's so fun to look back on this, but I realized, OK, I you, can't you know have what, every you know what strikes person. me, Dickie, yeah. though, is, is like mm. is that uh, it seems like like I'm I'm always surprised when I, I listening to you recount this is like it's it's crazy that it, this was also recent because like when I also look at your presence on you know platforms like twitter i'm like oh my god this guy's like massive and and but it's crazy to me you're like oh yeah this was like you know x month in 2020 and i had like no followers and i was like i I remember following you at that time i think i was following you when you had like a couple hundred followers or something like that but it's just i i just want to make a note of that because i think that is actually potentially like inspiring to other people that like here's a guy who you know people look at and like oh you know one of the most, uh, you know, followed people on Twitter, one of the most saved threads guys on Twitter, all that kind of stuff. But like, you know, looking back just like two years, 24 months, you were, you weren't really on the map yet. So I just want to make a note of that because I think that's, it's inspiring to me and and I think probably to others as well. Yeah. And the fun part about that is that two years feels like forever for me, but I'm slowly recognizing as I'm getting older um, 26 now that two years is nothing. And that if you'd have told me two years ago, like all this was, was about to happen, I'd have said there's absolutely no way that that um, <laughs> little writing accountability group turns into where it is now. So I guess fast forward through yeah, yeah. that first cohort, it was 
$50 and I was so terrified to charge money for something on the internet that it was $50, but you got all your money back if you completed all 30 days. So here I am, like, I got a PayPal account. I'm like wiring money back and forth, collecting money, tracking it in a spreadsheet, like making sure people are writing every day. And granted, I'm still working full time at BlackRock. So this is from 4.30 to 7 in the morning and then from 6 to 10 at night. Every night I was kind of balancing that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I held one on one interviews with all 50 people in that original cohort. You know, what worked? What didn't? How could we improve? What could go into this? How would this have been a better experience? And I realized that this was a real problem. People wanted to write, but they didn't know how to continuously do it. They didn't know the frameworks. They didn't know how to build a writing habit. They didn't know how to stick with it. They didn't. They weren't getting any kind of engagement from uh, the market because they were putting it on a blog that no one was reading. And so slowly I realized, hey, in solving my own problem, I knew that I was going to solve the problem of thousands of other people. So Ship 30 has basically for the last two years been an evolution of that, of trying to get as many people as possible to have the kind of personal breakthrough writing that I had. And we are now at over 5,600 students. I partnered with Nicholas Cole, who's been writing on the internet since 2015, 2014, back on Quora. Mm -hmm. And I partnered with him in January of 21 because he knew the game of online writing way more than I did. I knew how to build a writing habit, but if Ship30 was going to scale to anything beyond a writing habit accountability group, uh, we needed to have, I needed to partner with him. And so that's been absolutely incredible. And the last two years, we've helped over 5,600 students start writing. We've run 13 or 14 cohorts at this point, And there's no signs of, uh, of slowing down. We're headed into January 23, which will be our biggest cohort yet. And that's going to be pretty exciting. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, congratulations um, on all of that growth. I think uh, it's it's inspiring to, to so many. Um, so, Dickie, you know, we talk a little bit about the career uh, transformation and it's been a really impressive to watch. Um, that's not been the only transformation that you've had, right? So you've had a, a physical transformation that I'm not sure people really completely understand or know about. So tell me about uh, about how you've transformed your body uh, over time. Yeah, I played center in college at 280 pounds. So five years ago last wow. week, maybe two weeks ago was uh, my last snap. So I played offensive line. And right when I finished playing, I realized I was going one of two ways. I was either going to 380 or 180. <laughs> and uh, within that first week, maybe first month, I was definitely on the path to 380. I basically maintained my old level of basic eating habits uh, mm. <laughs> because I had to eat so much to maintain my my body weight at that level, but I wasn't exercising or working out as nearly as much as I was. And so, yeah, the last five years, I've more or less rewritten my entire operating system uh, in terms of health. I do weigh 184 pounds now. I've, I've tried every diet. I've tried every single hack trick cardio, lifting. I mean, I've done it all. And it's been a fun journey over the last five years kind of exploring that. And I by no means have it all figured out. But I've gotten to a place where I know I built a foundation to kind of build from here. And it's been fun. It's been a uh, an interesting ride to learn so much about myself and how much I had to change the way I thought about fitness and daily activity and things like that uh, along this journey. Wow. Yeah, that's 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 incredible. Um, so how tall are you, by the way? I'm a little under six, two. So I, okay. I, I was six, two on the roster. I'm really about six, one. So, <laughs> OK, I'm, a, I'm about the uh, I'm about the same height. And, and that's that's uh, you, so you were, you know, 280. You were big dude, big dude. And that's a lot. That's a lot on your body. That's a lot of weight to be carrying around, um, especially as you get older. So kudos to you for for learning how to transform your body both into a football player and then out of a football player. That's that's quite a that's quite a serious feat. I'm sure you learn a lot about your body. Um, and I want to talk about nutrition and what you're doing today there. So all right. So let me, I want to transition a little bit here and I want to talk about systems, right? So we hear you talk a lot about um, your writing systems um, all the time. Um, but I think 
and, and I, and I, and I think a lot of people probably look at you and you're like, oh my God, this guy gets so much done. Like he dominates on Twitter. He publishes something every day. He's, he's on YouTube doing this and that he's running his own business now. And it's like, I think people look at it and they're like, ah, that's, that's too pie in the sky. Right. I, I can't do that. And I have this theory that Dickie Bush does not, and people who achieve similar levels of success like you do not necessarily have like Herculean willpower. Um, but more when you figured out something on the system side and you uh, are really organized and you can almost set up your life in like a paint by numbers fashion where you've made the decision of this is what's going to happen. And I just need to execute, execute, execute every day. Um, so for, well, let me ask you first, is that, would do you think that's a appropriate characterization of how you set up your life? I, I'd love to sit here and say I had it all perfectly organized and I'd be lying because what I found is I have actually tried for many years to organize something into like the perfect system for everything. Yep. And time and time again, because of how much my life has changed or is constantly changing, I think I have not been able to reliably have like this perfect notion dashboard that tracks everything and all that. Right. Yep. What I think I've done a decent job of is I have figured out about myself that I am like a liquid and I will take the shape of whatever container I put myself in for better or worse which basically means I can create artificial constraints, artificial deadlines, artificial cadences, and create a level of both urgency, stress, and uh, really urgency and stress around completing those and sticking to that system with anything in my life. So I look back at kind of the different things I did at a decently high level, Call of Duty, speed cubing, math, football and it all was I picked something I built some kind of obsession with it and out of that obsession was some kind of daily cadence weekly cadence that if I stuck to made the results inevitable now I don't have a perfect way of tracking that I wish I did I wish I had the level of organization that I, I think I could have but I don't I think it's more I I pick something I do more that is than the average person is willing to do that such that not pro, not progressing in that area would be unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And that's usually my approach to anything is, is bring a level of volume intensity and obsession that you actually don't need the perfect system because you're doing enough where the results will take care of themselves. And then the most important things will emerge. And then you kind of cut the rest and double down on those. And that, 80, 20 constantly done over time is where I think I have seen the most progress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm taking notes on this because, um, so volume, intensity, and obsession. And I like the way you put that. I think you you said something along the lines of where progress is, it would be unreasonable if progress didn't happen with that level of volume, intensity, and obsession. Um, now you think about applying that to your uh, different parts of your life. And you, you mentioned several of them. Um, let's talk about how you apply that to your own, uh, routines every, in every day. And so, um, I want to get into, um, talking about, you know, what you do for your health, fitness, all that kind of stuff too. Cause I think that's, I think you put out a lot of really interesting content. Uh, and I think you bring the uh, on that topic and i think you bring this level of organization systems based thinking not only to your professional work but also to your personal life and your health and wellness and all that stuff so let's talk about that and i and i kind of want to frame it up um in in a way that's that's uh, a little more approachable to people and that's it, within the form of a typical day. So what a typical day looks like for you. So I want to go through what a day looks like. And I want to get like pretty specific, actually, because I know 
Um, I think people really want to hear the specifics of, you know, everything from like, okay, is there a supplement that he's using? Is there a device that he's using? And mm. I don't, not that it's great to lean on crutches like that, but like, let's hear some specifics. So like, let's start a typical day. Let's start. Uh, I assume a typical day starts the night before for you. So let's, so let's start there. Like, tell me about what is, what does the sleep routine look like uh, for Dickie Bush to, to power you to do all this stuff the next day? Yeah, I, I love geeking out on this so we can get as granular and I'll, I'll try to get as specific as possible because I, I enjoy hearing this on other people too. But I will lay down an important preface that I am a single 26 year old living in Miami in a two bedroom apartment with very little external responsibilities. And I understand that this routine, my routines will not work for everyone. I don't anticipate on doing the type of things that I do today forever. And I just like to lay that down because I know I'm in an extremely fortunate position where these won't work for everyone. But for this select group of people that are in a similar situation as me, I think they'll be pretty helpful. And I think anyone can take away some of the things that I've started to do. So yeah, yeah. I just but, like to lay well, that thank out you, there. Thank you for that <laughs> disclaimer. Let's come back to that because uh, I've seen you in Crossfire many times, not in Crossfire, but I've seen a lot of people on Twitter come back to you a lot of times like, oh, wait till you have kids, dude. And so I want to ask you that specific question. And I can give you some perspective too, as a 44 year old who's got three kids, I'm a little different part of the journey than you. Um, but thank you for that disclaimer. But, um, okay. So let's, so sleep, tell me about it. Starts definitely the night before. I think the easiest way to track it would be I finish up dinner around seven. I like to eat relatively early. And from there, I'll take um, two supplements, creatine and magnesium bisglycinate. And those have been I've taken creatine since I played football. But magnesium bisglycinate is what I think is like the perfect night time. My sleep is drastically improved quality wise when I put that about 90 minutes uh, before I go to bed. From there, I'll, I'll take a quick walk, come back and make some chamomile lavender tea, sit down. And I have like a list of things I like to do at night. I put my phone on airplane mode. I try to get it out of the way. And then I either journal or I'll do some foam rolling. I'll read. I will sometimes pick up my iPad and just read on that. I mean, I, I don't have anything super specific other than I just kind of try to wind down. And if I have anything on my mind, that's the number one thing is getting anything, any open loops down on a piece of paper so that I'm not going to bed with a clouded head. The more I do in business, the more I realize that basically every day you're going to open up as many open loops as possible. And if you just continually, continuously leave those open before you go to bed, you're not going to have much success because then you're going to get up in the morning. You're not going to have a clear head and things just kind of compound negatively from there. So I will brain dump anything that's on my mind. And then I like to be extremely intentional about mapping out the first five to six hours of my day the next day saying, here's exactly the workout I'm going to do. Here's the exact um, time I'm going to wake up. Here's the exact task I want to work on for three to four hours. And that allows me to wake up calmly and peacefully knowing I don't have to rush. I know what I'm doing this morning. And so that combination of getting my all those ideas out of my head and knowing exactly what I'm going to do when I wake up the next day allows me to get high quality sleep. And I sleep from 930 to about 5, 515, 530. I don't have an alarm, but I have a dawn simulator because if you don't know what a dawn simulator is, it basically... It's an alarm clock that lights up your room slowly uh, yeah. oh, as if yeah, the sun yeah. was rising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So D-A-W-N simulator. And that allows me to wake up naturally without being jerked awake. The idea of waking up to an alarm is to me, alarm. Alar like th think about it from a, from a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. If you were shaken awake by a loud noise, it meant you were about to danger, die. Right? Yeah. You were about Man, you to die. Run. And if every other scenario where you woke up naturally, it meant you weren't in danger. So why would you want to be? I mean, obviously, again, back to the preface, I'm fortunate enough to be able to wake yeah, out yeah. without an alarm clock. No, you'll, but you'll, I woke you'll, up. You'll, you'll get plenty you know, of experience at some point. Right. Probably with exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I can't wait until I have that. But I mean, for mm -hmm. four years on Wall Street, my alarm was a loud alarm at 430 in the morning. So I've evolved into this um, more passive wake up, but 
So that's that's the sleep. I don't know if you have any questions, but so, uh, that's kind of my my, my game plan. But uh, what do you what do you like to read before bed? I do not do a good enough job reading books. I think I read under five books last year. It's because that's surprising I, for someone who's uh, so focused on you know. Yeah, but here's here's the thing. Yeah, I have found that most reading is actually procrastination, mm-hmm. where what I found was if I continue to read, all I would do was find new shiny objects to chase yeah. when I know almost exactly what I need to be doing right now in most areas of my life. And so I don't have a reason to go look for more answers to things. Yeah. So reading for me, there was a period where I read 40 books in 2019 mm-hmm. because I was searching I was searching for better systems, better habits. You know, I wanted a better understanding. But right now, every time I pick up a book, I'm like, I kind of know what this is going to say. Or Mm -hmm. I know it's going to send me down a path of that I don't need to go down at this exact moment. And so I've just been putting that off. Yeah. So uh, from from personal experience, so I I, uh, have read lots of self-help books or self-improvement books in my day. And I got in a bad loop of um, reading them right before bed, which is not a good idea because then you're thinking, oh, you're, you're really in your own head about your own habits and I want to do this. And you're coming up with to-do lists and all that kind of stuff. So I made a complete transformation. Like if I'm going to read anything um, self-help related, I'm looking over my shoulder right now and seeing this uh, Atomic Habits uh, book behind me. If I'm going to read anything like that, actually, I a lot of times I will listen to those as audio books now and I'll do it during the day on a walk or something like that. Um, but at night I have exclusively changed that to either fiction and I'm not a big fiction reader, but, or more, more likely what I'm reading is more history and his, you know, and his, mm. you know, historical kind of, um, nonfiction is a genre that I've come to just love. And so what I'll do is that's the last thing I'm doing at the end of the day is I am diving into a story and I'm basically, till my eyes are closing. And so like right now I'm reading um, uh, Isaacson's biography of Ben Franklin and I'm not reading it to try to take a bunch of Kindle notes so I can come up with a thread and this and that. There's like no pressure. It is just, I'm losing myself in a story. And so anyways, I'll, I'll just throw that out there because that's a habit mm. that's kind of worked for me. I really like that. I have been thinking, what do I want to be reading? That is, it's not unrelated, but it's, it's, orthogonal Mm -hmm. and that just means for anyone who's not a math nerd (laughs) pointing in a not opposite but just different direction than the things i do on a daily basis so i like that yeah okay um all right let's talk about what the next morning looks like so you're waking up um and i think you are going directly into doing something physically is that right or, or yeah. let's talk about that and let's, let's talk about exercise, generally speaking. But go take it wherever you want to take it. So that first, I've played around a ton with this and I, I'm still experimenting where there's a season of my life where I'd get up and the very first thing I do was go to my computer and write for 90 minutes. So no fewer than five minutes of being awake, brush my teeth and then sit down. I found that my brain tends to fire best about 90 minutes to two hours after being awake. And so the first 90 minutes now are um, cardio and some kind of either core or arms, not a full lift, but a, you know, single, uh, it's really core or arms stacked onto running. So my first, uh, throughout the week, I'm running about 10 miles a week, split across three runs, Tuesday or Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then on mm, Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday, I'm just going for a walk. And so I'm always up and I know that I'm getting out the door within the first 15 to 20 minutes. So I'll hop on a quick foam roller, kind of get anything out. I'll hydrate. And if this is where we can get specific, I drink 64 ounces of water as kind of quickly as I can and take an electrolyte supplement. That has been the number one energy boosting habit I've done this year was actually getting a high quality electrolyte supplement that are caps and not any artificial sugar, nothing like that. These are from Relight. It's actually a potassium heavy um, electrolyte supplement because most are either sodium heavy. So it's just like you're having salt, but I have plenty of salt. Potassium, even in having things like bananas is relatively hard to come by, but 
how I discovered that I think I p- was perpetually potassium deficient. I was in Costa Rica for a two week kind of off the grid trip and I was drinking coconut, like fresh coconut. I'd never had it before. And I went and started researching. Why did I feel so amazing every single time after having a coconut? And it was, they were extremely potassium heavy. Mm. And so I, I started to do that. I don't have any caffeine until I get back from that cardio. And that to me is a very potent morning of I'm up. I know what I'm doing. I know I'm going to get moving. I'm getting blood flowing. I'm checking a box off the day of I'm having some kind of workout out of the way. Mm -hmm. And then the caffeine hits differently. Um, I've done intermittent fasting till 2 p.m. for a long time, but I'm kind of in a muscle building phase right now. And I know that I want to be having more meals more often. And so that, again, we we could do a five hour podcast on just all the different, you know, little things I've experimented with on the health side. But I get back from that cardio. I make a a quick high fat, high protein breakfast and uh, caffeinate. And then I try to work for five hours, four or five hours. And that's usually around seven to noon where I keep my phone on airplane mode. I keep my, the internet more or less blocked. And I try to have that first four or five hours outlined where I could work very in depth on something and everything else takes care of itself. When I have that time of the day up to noon, I get a good night's sleep. I get my cardio in. My brain's firing. I can focus. I'm taking walks in between. So lots we could dig into there, and I'm happy to take it any direction. But that's kind of the the staple of my morning. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I have a theory that um, every day, especially in the morning, um, there's there's two things you need to get out of you. You need to get some physical energy out of you, and you need to get some creative energy out of you. Part of it is just like. You know, I I think that's actually um, a big mental health um, uh, thing as well. So like I I typically so I I'll I'll exercise first thing in the morning. That's the first thing I do when I get out of bed. Well, actually, I'm not as disciplined as you because the first thing I'll do usually is actually look at Twitter. Then I'll go um, get either cardio or lifting workout in. Um, but but um, but the cardio especially, and I'm like a big Peloton guy, but like the cardio to me is like as much mental health as it is, um, mm-hmm. as it is like actual cardiovascular health. Right. And it's just like, like this morning I knew I was doing this podcast. I was like, boom, let me just get on that 20 minute, like bang out a 20 minute Peloton ride. And it just like instant mood enhancer for me. And I'm like, okay, now I'm in the right mind space for that. Um, but let me back up, Dickie, just to the to um, I wanted to I want to talk a little bit about running, and I want to talk about just cover off on that electrolyte um, yeah. drink. So is that a, is that a powder or is that a capsule? And these are capsules. Mentioned? So okay. it's it's a relight R E dash L Y T E. I'll send you the link afterwards. But okay. you take I take four capsules of that, which I think is two servings, and it is a noticeable difference in. Um, I, I heard Huberman talk about this where your body is actually not responsive to caffeine for the first 90 minutes to two hours, but it is, it's an endocrine system, I think is the right word, um, is what is kind of dominating you waking up. And if you feed that with electrolytes, it feels like you're having coffee. Mm-hmm. It feels your body reacts very similar, similarly. So yep. Yep. that I've have anecdotal evidence that that is 100% true. Okay. Okay. Um, and then on the running side, okay. So it's funny. I, uh, I ran like some cross country and track and stuff like that as a, as a kid. And then, um, got back into, have been, you know, it was into running various points in my twenties and stuff like that, but really kind of got out of it, um, uh, because it was a little too tough on the joints and the back and stuff like that. But one of my goals for 23 is to get back into it. So I added one of my weekly goals is to one run one mile a week, right? The whole kind of James mm-hmm. Clear theory of floss one tooth, right? It's, it's going to end up being more than one mile, but I want to be out there running once a week. Um, and I want to run, and I think I just put, well, I want to run one race. Um, and I haven't run a race in like years and years. Mm. So Tell me about, I think running was relatively a uh, newer kind of focus for you this past year. Like t- t- what would be the Cliff's Notes versions of what you learned and, and what you, if you were starting from scratch again today, what would be the most important thing you would focus on? Yeah, I'm going to write an in-depth blog post on this, breaking down my experience. So 2019, I ran zero miles, 2020, or sorry, 
2020, I ran zero miles. 2021, I think I ran 20 because I picked it up at the end of December. And in 2022, I'll have run over 600. So I got up pretty quickly on the running game. I hated running for so long because it was just, I was the chubby kid in middle school and high school and I would play the offensive line. So the idea of you know putting in miles was always associated with a negative experience until I kind of went down the zone two cardio training rabbit hole and realized you can run at a 140 beats per minute heart rate and it's not difficult. It feels really good to do. And that was just a big belief break for me. So I worked up to about 20 miles a week in March, April, May of this year. And that was too much. I was battling a perpetual calf injury after that. And I was still lifting three or four times a week, but I was primarily just down the rabbit hole of running. And I could summarize the mistakes I made as I was running too hard. So even as I was tracking my heart rate with a heart rate strap, trying to keep it in that zone two range, I was still running too hard. I didn't have the discipline to, um, and because at the time I was dieting and trying to kind of still lose body fat, I was always associating my run with, if I run more, I'm going to lose weight faster because I was still on that weight loss journey, um, which I've kind of transitioned out of now. And I wasn't taking care of my lower body. So I didn't have a, di the most, the mental model I use for running is that the purpose of every run right now is to run the next time. That's it. Where if I know that my focus on that run is so that I can run again the next time, I run easier. I take care of my body to get ready for it. I take care of my body afterwards and I don't try to push anything excessive. And the result is I ran my first race. I'd never raced anything. I was in Columbus, Ohio for Thanksgiving. And on Monday, I saw that there was a Thanksgiving five mile race. Mm -hmm. And I, there was also a 2.6 mile walk that my mom and sister could do. So we did it as a family and I ran five miles at a 730 pace. So I think awesome. whatever that comes out to 37, something like that. And it blew me away. That was way faster. My goal was eight minutes per mile when I, when I went into it. Mm -hmm. And it was because I've, for the last 20 weeks, I've run 10 miles at a very slow pace. I'm talking 10, 10, 30, 11 minute miles. And that was extremely uncomfortable to do because my heart rate sits around 135, 140, and it is a cruise. I am chilling. But that built such a strong foundation. I stayed injury free. I didn't miss any runs. And I, blew myself out of the water in that, in that race of what I thought I could do. So if I could start all over, I would say work up to five to 10 miles a week, very slowly, take a 10 year view that I want to be running for 10 years. And what would it look like to be 35 and have a solid running routine? And if I extend the time horizon to that, that means I'm not going to be adding very much every week. I'm not going to stress too much about the speed of any single run. I'm going to take care of my body in an extreme way. And uh, yeah, th those are kind of the big takeaways. Get shoes, rotate your shoes. That's a big one. Um, yeah. I was running yeah. in the same pair of shoes that I was walking in. So my lower body was adjusting to a single striking pattern. And I went down another kind of shoe rabbit hole of you want to be mixing those up. And so I learned that. Um, I, again, this just goes back to when you dive into anything, you're going to learn so much along the way. So definitely learned a lot on the running side and I know it's something I want to continue to keep doing. So I'm very intentional now about keeping my volume lower and, yeah. uh, keeping my body healthy. Cool. Cool. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, that is super helpful, especially the, the zone two, your, your experience with the zone two, um, and, and keeping, keeping yourself in that kind of heart rate zone. Um, uh, I am really going to look forward to that blog post that you write, um, because I want to, I, I do want to go deeper down that rabbit hole and I want to learn about, um, I want to learn about the heart rate monitor you, you were using, like, I want to know, like, would a, would my whoop or Apple watch be sufficient? Uh, is it accurate enough? Um, I want to know more about the shoes, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Uh, I'll uh, send it your way when it's live. Cool. Cool. Okay. And I, uh, and I can link to it. Um, you know, depending on when that comes out, um, uh, as well. Okay. Um, all right. Nutrition. So you talked a little bit about, um, 
you talked a little bit about how your morning starts with like a high fat, high protein breakfast. I think you said, um, you recently wrote in one of your Twitter, um, uh, postings that life is much better in calorie surplus than in calorie deficit. I think that's kind of obvious what you mean by that, but, but talk to me a little bit just about the general philosophy that you're at, um, from a nutrition standpoint. Yeah, it's a fun one. So, I, I mean, I spent five years trying every single diet, uh, carnivore, keto, high carb, low carb, no sugar. I never went vegan cause that never made sense to me, but the, uh, I tried everything, intermittent fasting, multiple day fasting, all that. And the unfortunate truth was all that was some kind of denial that if you want to lose weight, you need to eat more and move less. And there's basically a a billion, hundreds of billions of dollars spent convincing people that that is not true. And it is true. You need to burn more calories than you uh, consume for an extended period of time if you want to lose weight. And I realized that. And so now I've gone, I achieved a a 10% body fat at 174 pounds this year, got as lean as I ever had through diligent tracking, learned the ins and outs. Tracking the body fat, by the way. Uh, DEXA scan. So signed up, was getting a quarterly DEXA scan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the most legit one there was because I wanted to be accurate with it. Yeah, I spoke with uh, Dan Go about that, and he was he was he's a big proponent of. I don't know if you know Dan, um, fit mm-hmm. founder on Twitter, but yeah. he's a big proponent of Texas Scan. So I actually put that as a that's a to do item on my twenty three list. So um, okay, so you got the Texas Scan. So, so you have a quarterly you know check in on you know body composition, where you're at from a fat standpoint, et cetera. Go ahead. Yeah. So my general nutrition, everything I settled on is I need to have one gram of protein per pound of body weight and the rest kind of doesn't matter. It's all about calories. And so I know I burn about 3000, 2900 a day, given my running and lifting and general steps. So if I track that and I eat more, I'm going to gain weight. If I eat less, I'm going to lose weight. And I, I think I spent a lot of time thinking that wasn't true. Found out it was. And so now my diet is as simple as it gets in that I only eat single or single ingredient foods. I could, I could list the 10 foods I eat any given day for breakfast. It's eggs, ground beef, spinach, avocado for lunch. It's ground beef, spinach, rice, an apple and a banana for dinner. It's ground beef or steak, potatoes and spinach and then dessert all have greek yogurt and blueberries i've done that basically every single day for um, since i moved to miami so june to now and it's funny that when you track and you are diligent and you find meals that really work well for you my energy level's never been higher i've never been stronger i've never been in better shape um and it just works right again is that going to be for everyone no Am I going to be able to do that forever? No. But at this current point, I know that that's optimal for getting the kind of results I want. And that's working extremely well. I've never felt it's just clean. And so if I was going to summarize my approach to to nutrition, it's figure out what your goal is. Do you want to stay the same weight? Do you want to gain weight or lose weight? And pick a calorie amount, figure out how you can learn to eat in a way that hits that goal consistently, and then only eat single ingredient whole foods and not whole foods to store, but just singular foods. And you're going to feel amazing. It's just as simple as that. My energy levels are extremely high because of that. I don't eat anything processed or alcohol. Well, I'm sure we can talk about, but yeah, it's as simple as it can be breakfast, lunch, and dinner dessert. And, uh, I stick with that. And it's funny when all the fads and all of those kind of melt away, you realize that that is just a, a super sustainable thing I can stick with. And it's worked. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, keeping it simple. I, I love I love that focusing on those s- single ingredient uh, kind of high nutrition density foods. That makes a ton of sense. Avoiding and processed stuff. That's where all the garbage is. Um, uh, carb from a carb standpoint. It sounds like you, you know you're not doing like keto or going super low carb. But are you trying to have carbs like later in the day? Is that a mm. focus of yours? Or I'm, I'm kind of surprised yeah. you said. I, did you say you eat rice like at lunch? Because that yeah. That's a, okay. Because I would worry about a little bit of a carb crash potentially with that. But how are you thinking about that? So I I go since I'm up early. I'm eating breakfast around seven a.m. and that is just 
fat protein. And that from a mental perspective is exactly what I need to operate. The second I put carbs in my body, like you said, your focus and Huberman has a good episode on this, but your focus is going to be lower quality. And so I wait until about 1 p.m. to eat lunch and that'll have rice and fruit and I'm lifting around 3.30. So about two, two and a half hours is when I start to um, put those in my body, knowing that I'm preparing for a lift. And on days that I don't lift, I won't have any carbs at lunch and wait, I'll wait until dinner. So days I don't lift, which are Wednesday during the week and then Saturday, Sunday, I can work for much longer, but I know that I still have that seven to noon where I feel like I'm getting the benefits of a low carb diet, which definitely are optimal for mental performance, but from physical performance, it's just not optimal for putting on muscle or anything like that. So yeah, rice, fruit for lunch, pre-workout, and then post-workout potatoes, fruit uh, for dinner. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, okay, you mentioned alcohol. So uh, this is this is a big topic for me. Um, I actually just had on uh, the CEO of Athletic Brewing Company. I don't know if you know those guys, but they're the biggest um, non-alcoholic um, beer company in the U.S., um, and so I've kind of been, I, I've experimented personally with going no alcohol at different points. 2018, I did a year without drinking. Um, this year, I'm um, something like 100 and I don't know, 50 days into um, not drinking now and starting to think of it more as a lifestyle. Um, I've, I actually have gotten into these non-alcoholic beers though. That's another um, topic, but tell me about your decision to not drink tell me about if that's a permanent decision if that's something you're working with right now and i also want to hear about like you know you're a guy in his 20s it's a little different like for me i'm in my 40s i'm like hey you know i don't want to drink because i don't want to be hung over with t- taking care of little kids the next day and you know i'm married to like the 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 nightlife uh you know social activity is not like a you know there's not a whole lot of craziness going on there but tell me about the no alcohol decision and also like how that affects your social life yeah another pillar post i want to write about this is go everything i've learned kind of going a year without it but yeah i stumbled into it actually so around november december last year it was the busiest time i was still working for blackrock but ship 30 had really accelerated and so i went three or four months without it without even noticing and i said huh my life hasn't changed it's better i haven't had any any break in momentum i think there's something to this and so i just committed to going the full year without it i'll tell you the immediate takeaways are Um, when you don't lose any momentum from any mild hangover, it is the most addicting feeling of progress I've ever had. Like for me, being able to get up on weekend mornings at mm 6am and work out and Mm -hmm. not feel like I've given up anything from a performance standpoint is massive. Huge, huge. And so I, I mean, it's addicting and it's, you know, you, I went into this kind of thinking, Uh, I wonder how long this is going to last, but I've honestly had nothing but positive experiences with it. So I'm definitely going another year and I want to further explore um, what that looks like. But Mm -hmm. I'll tell you another immediate benefit was the realization of how many people I had hung out with. Mm -hmm. And the only common thing we had was that we were drinking alcohol together. And so when that was eliminated, it was I was no longer going to just go to a bar and hang out because that'd be very boring. Um, But people that I had probably known for a while I didn't want to build with for 50 years kind of fell out of my, you know, circle of friends. Mm -hmm. And that has been another strong benefit of this is the realization that there are the for a lot of people, their only thing in common with some of their friends is that they go to a bar together. So that was another big lesson from this. Now, I'll tell a couple little anecdotes on the social side. So at first, obviously, there's a fear of like, oh, my goodness, I'm not going to have what do I do if I can't drink alcohol? So the first one was that I stopped doing a lot of those activities that only revolved around alcohol, which was a strict positive in my life, going to clubs, going to bars, all those. I had grown out of it after my time in New York, really in 2019, early 2020, before COVID, like I had kind of stopped that life. I knew that the type of people that I wanted to build and kind of interact with, I was not going to have uh, positive experiences with at places like that. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into there's 
the perfect filter for the type of people that I want to surround myself with. So when I'd be at a social event and I'd drink a soda water or whatever, and someone would say, oh, can I grab a drink? I'd say, no, I'm just, I'll take a soda water. They're like, oh, you're not drinking? I'm like, yeah, I'm going a year without it. So that was my thing. Mm-hmm. I had a nice, uh, it's not, I don't drink, it's not this. It's like, yeah, I'm going a year without yep. it. And there were two yep. reactions. There were go, you know, someone would go, why? Mm-hmm. And kind of like turn their nose up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And immediately, after well, I, would, I would say it, yeah. is, it is consistently the only drug, maybe outside of caffeine, that if you don't do it, it's weird not to do it. Right, right. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there a lot of that, I think, was projection because it totally clashes with their worldview of like, oh, I literally drink three times a week. And this yep. person says they're not doing it for a whole year. Like immediate clash of worldview kind of need to sort that out of my head. And so I get defensive. Now. The other reaction was people who'd go, that's awesome. I've been thinking about doing something similar. Can you tell me more about it? Can you tell me more about this? And it's funny, those are the type of people that I really wanted to attract. Mm -hmm. And so I made a bunch of friends who are exploring it now and I've gotten to talk to about it. And look, I never had a quote unquote problem with alcohol. I think I had a normalized problem in college where I drank 30 beers a week because that's just what people did, (laughs) right? It was cool to do that. And so I never looked at it that way, but I, in December of last year, I said, I think it's been 10 years since I went a month without drinking Mm -hmm. 10 years, 25 years old. And so I, I said, what would it look like for a year to go by without it? And will I have the chance to do this on my own terms ever again? I don't know. So I just gave it a try. So socially, it's been a positive. Physically, it's been a positive. The only thing I will say that I miss is when I have a very nice steak, I would love to have uh, a glass of red wine. So I am coming up with some heuristics about when I'm going to break this streak and i think it's going to have to be in a foreign country and the steak has to be over 40 ounces if i find myself <laughs> in that situation uh then then okay i get Those are some pretty it. good guardrails i would right say. it's yeah. good guardrails but hey if i'm in argentina and there's like a tomahawk that's put in front of me yeah, and they had yeah. this the the vineyard is up the road where they grew yeah, yeah. the grapes that made the wine i'm gonna dabble yeah. so that that's I where know. i'm at right now Okay. Okay. That my, so my experience, uh, even though I'm quite a bit older, has been very um, uh, similar. And actually, um, one of the things I've written about is, you know, it's funny. I think when you don't drink, um, at first it's a little difficult. Your friends are sort of react weird to it. Um, uh, there's some peer pressure to get you to drink. But then a funny thing happens is a switch flips and no one expects you to drink um, uh, anymore. And so the the world the, the world starts sort of conforming around you. So what I noticed is going to friends' parties and stuff like that. All of a sudden, they're stocking non-alcoholic beverages because they know I'm going to be there. Um, the other thing is, I mentioned this non-alcoholic beer. So this is a um, sort of a, uh, a rabbit hole I've gone down and gotten really interested in, like um, some of these non-alcoholic beers. So like Athletic is a big one, uh, but all the big brewers are coming out with them now. There's like Guinness Zero. There's um, Heineken zero zero, et cetera. Um, and it's just really proliferating. But, um, what I've noticed is now a lot of my friends are like, uh, okay, let me, let me try one of those athletics. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me, let me start like working one or two of those into my, um, evening and all of a sudden, like there's a real sea change going on. That's becoming more mm-hmm. acceptable. But for me, I've noticed <clears throat> actually being able to drink something like that at a wedding or at a party or whatever, for whatever reason, maybe it's placebo effect. I don't know what it is, but it's night and day between drinking like a seltzer water and that. Like when I'm at a wedding and I'm drinking club soda or something, I'm like, this sucks, you know? But what if I'm drinking even a non-alcoholic beer? I'm like, I'm part of the action. Like, so I don't know what it is, but I'll just throw that out there as well from a social perspective, something that I've noticed. Yeah, I've had a bunch of positive experiences followed up with weddings. And so that's been another positive reinforcement where I had a great, great time at the wedding. I was sober and then I woke up the next day and I had a great workout in the morning and I explored the city I was in while kind of everyone else was hung over in bed. And I just keep having these these positive reinforcing experiences where uh, it just 
it's more votes for staying sober for longer. And uh, so I'm going to kind of continue to chase that path for a little bit. Love that. Love that. So, so one of the things that I, that we mentioned um, earlier in the conversation is that uh, there's kind of this idea of like, okay, Dickie is accomplishing so much every day and blah, blah, blah. But, oh, wait till this guy has kids. He's got another thing coming, right? And, you know, all this uh, this 5 a.m. wake up and this, you know, five hours of uninterrupted work. Like, good luck, dude. That's not going to happen. Um, tell me about uh, – tell me about your view just on that and – And also just the idea of hustle culture, maybe this is two questions in one, but the idea of hustle culture and then this pushback that you get and and how you think about uh, how you think about that. My response to that is I cannot wait until I cannot work for five hours in the morning because my children, I get to interact with my children. That's always my response. Every single thing I do on a daily basis right now is to build the foundation to be a world class father in 10 years. Every single thing I wake up and that's the first thing I think about. And so people come at me with that and I'm like, look, you're just confirming that I'm doing the right thing because as a 26 year old, I know that the number one focus should be my health and my financial foundation. And that anyone who has negative things to say about some single 26 year old doing things like that saying, oh, just wait, I, I think didn't do what I was doing at my age. And so the idea that they know anything about how to transition into that when someone has kids, I don't think they know either. So I've learned to kind of ignore that. And I've realized that all the parents that I really look up to are not angry people on Twitter. And so uh, understanding that and the type of person who is reading and responding and gets visibly or physically or emotionally, you know, upset at reading someone who's doing something like that. I know that it's not someone I want to take advice from. So I don't let that bother me. I'm excited to adapt my routines when I have kids. I think it's going to be absolutely incredible. And so everything I'm building is towards that. And so that that's how I handle that. Now on the hustle culture side, look, I think that anyone who's thinks that you're not going to accomplish things if you bring more volume and more intensity to what you're doing is lying. And I think the idea of a work life balance when a lot of the people I hear talking about work-life balance are balancing work and life that I don't want anything to do with. And um, that's my, my inconvenient truth take is that I'm working right now to build a life and work that I can balance in the future. And that means being out of balance to begin with. I think you would, you unlock the ability to balance things after you were unbalanced. And so I am unbalanced right now. I'm focusing far more on my business and my health than I am on new relationships or travel or experiences. And I know that when I extend the time horizon over 25 to 50 years, all that is going to come. And so I can kind of chunk things away. And while I have the ability to focus and work as hard as I am right now, I'm going to take advantage of that. I love it. I I think you're someone who's a little further along in the journey. Um, uh, at least in terms of years, I would, I think you're thinking about it exactly the right way. And I think, um, I think all the foundation that you're laying today, I can't think of a better foundation to lay for yourself that when you are a father, uh, husband, all that at some point, I think you're going to look back and be like, damn, I'm really happy. I set this foundation, both health wise, business wise, uh, et cetera. And, and your idea of being a little bit out of balance, um, makes a ton of sense, uh, to me as well. All right. Last question I want to hit you with here, Dickie. It's kind of my standard closing question and it's kind of hard to, for one to just, well, we just have a minute, minute left, but I'm going to hit you anyways. Um, tell me one thing that you think that you've figured out in life so far that maybe others haven't yet. There will never be a perfect time to start anything. And the idea of killing your onces, where if you're saying to yourself, once this happens, once work slows down, once I feel prepared, once I move cities, once I get to a new job, that that'll be the perfect time to start something Uh, that never comes. You are always going to be busy. So the perfect time to start something is the immediate second that you think about it. Find a way to take a forward step on that new endeavor. And if you continuously do that, you're going to make progress where Anytime now I find myself saying once I, I actively figure out a way to immediately make progress on whatever, whatever it is I'm saying. And I think I've, I've done that. It's allowed me to get up to speed on things quickly throughout my life. And that's the number one thing I think I figured out. Love it, man. Dude, that is, you got me ready to 
pound through a brick wall right now just saying that one um all right well listen this has been a ton of fun uh for me i've been a fan of yours for for quite a while so i appreciate doing it and and let me tell you, man, I, I told you um, at the get-go that you're one of the clearest thinkers that I know. And I think a lot of that comes from your daily writing habit, your focus on, on systems. Um, and when I look at you, especially at your age, I'm like, holy shit, the world is wide open for this guy in a really, really good way. So I'm excited to watch where you're going to bring this whole thing. And um, it's just it's just been fun to watch it. It's super fun to talk to you, man. So I, I really appreciate you spending some time with me. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Greg. Uh, and I look forward to round two. All right. Let's do it, man. Thanks. Talk soon.